We begin? Uh, so, uh, as you, you wish. begin my spiel. As you I'm, wish. I'm sitting comfortably. Yeah. yeah. I'll begin my spiel then. My spiel goes like this. Uh, you know, the economic calculation argument was far older than Mises, but Mises made it his own. The idea of human capital can be found in Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, not just once, but many times Smith uh, is quite preoccupied with human capital. But Danny Becker has made it his own just recently since the, the war. Now, two economists worth reading always, no matter how mistaken they are, are Gary Becker and Mark Brown. But both of them hold a thesis that education is almost bound to be investment, which I think our, talk tonight, our speaker tonight is going to refute. Uh, uh, and with that, I hand it over to Stephen. Yes. Um, I, I'm not talking about human capital in general. I am just talking about how it relates to uh, education, in particular further education. And um, the, thing, the thing is that, the, of course, the right and the left differ on all sorts of things. But they uh, seem to be united on this, that uh, education, and the more the better, it seems to be the case here, is uh, the key to the knowledge-based economies of the future. There was a report to the British Parliament, uh, the Deering uh, report, I believe, and uh, the quote which I'd like you to hear is, learning is the key to prosperity. Investment in human capital will be the foundation of success in the 21st century. And there's hardly a dissenter, really, to this in the Western world. It, if we look at Europe or North America, Australia, Australia, Japan, uh, the trend is towards more and more education. The expenditure is increasing, the number of teachers are growing, and uh, in many countries the percentage of students who enjoy the benefits of college education, in particular age group exceeds 50% of that particular age group. Um, the UK, uh, like Japan, had a once a highly selective system uh, governing entrance to university. And now it sends about a third of 18-year-olds uh, to college, I believe. And even the um, indomitable Swiss, I gather, have finally cracked. And they had a strong tradition of apprenticeship, but now they, they too are sending more and more uh, youngsters to university. And uh, around about 2005, and most of my figures in this talk will date from uh, the first five years of the um, 21st century, that 15% of school leavers were uh, registered for university attendance, which was double the level um, of five years previously. I actually had a debate, just to show you that it goes across the political spectrum. I had a debate over the internet with uh, Minford, Patrick Minford, who was a pretty... Uh, regarded as being a sort of right-wing economist. And he mentioned something about this, you know, we need the uh, students for the uh, future economy. And I criticised him. And actually, for ages and ages, he didn't even see the point. I don't think it was uh, me being obtuse or unclear. He just thought it was such a given that we had to have students to produce a successful economy, and the more the better. Uh, eventually, we came round and had a, had a, well, did have a discussion about it, but, you know, it was just accepted by him. Um, and I, I, I was a, felt a bit lonely, really, with these views. Uh, I think David uh, shared them to some extent. I remember having a debate with him about them. Uh, and then this book came out. Now, it's, unfortunately, it's a bit battered now, and the uh, title has gone, but if you could read it, it would say... <laughs> Does education matter? And it's about the myths about education and economic growth. And it's by Alison Wolfe, Professor Wolfe, who's the um, head of education at the University of London. And uh, she's written quite, quite a good book, questioning a lot of the uh, stuff about uh, human capital and all sorts of other things about education. Actually, the human capital, I did write to her, and, I put, and she said that everybody was commenting on the human capital aspects. And, uh, criticisms of the uh, more education, better economic growth arguments. Um, and she wished to look at the other stuff as well. But anyway, this is what I'm going to talk about tonight. I think it's far and away the most important. Um, we should be clear what the argument here is. Uh, the more educated uh, will tend to earn more than their less educated compatriots. There's no doubt about that. Uh, the, and the economists have then gone on to correlate extra years at college uh, with increments in income. And 
<coughs> Professor Wolf, she says, um, she wants to question whether it was the time at college which made these high earning people skilled. Um, and she also questions whether you, if you had more people going to college, they would all then go on to become high earners. And, um, and whether further uh, additions to time at college will automatically lead to extra GDP. And uh, she even puts under the uh, microscope the idea that education and economic success will be closely linked in the 21st century. Um, and she just put forward the possibility that we might have an over-educated workforce, um, which is also quite interesting. Anyway, uh, there's no doubt that in the modern world, if you've got the right qualifications uh, in the right subjects from the right universities, then that's important. Um, whichever country you look at, then you'll find that uh, the educators, educated people earn more. Uh, but the point is, if an employer hires graduates, might they just be not looking um, to see what skills they've gained, but just looking for a method of ascertaining ability of a particular candidate? Uh, Wolf uh, says this is the, in fact the case that education has become a socially acceptable method of ranking people. Um, the better education, on the better educated on the whole, will be smarter and work harder. And uh, if you hire them with uh, credentials, then it's easy, it's convenient, it's legal, and it's not going to lead you into trouble. Uh, and the point being that the billions of uh, public money poured into education uh, may have just resulted in a rather expensive method of job filtering. Uh, see, education can, can, it can be correlated to general intelligence, it can be correlated to motivation, perseverance, even organisational abilities. And these are all desirable qualities for an employer. And if you can get all these qualities uh, in a package, which is, say, a degree or an American high school diploma, then the employer is going to be happy. I, I, Will says that um, Suppose that everyone left school for good at the age of 15 or even 12, instead of the modern habit of staying on longer and longer. Suppose too that before leaving, everyone took some exams which provided a clear ranking of population. How much less productive would the economy and most of these people then be? I mean, I would think that actually, uh, it might well be the economy might function more effectively and that the billions which are spent on education could be returned to uh, people and use more efficiently. Uh, you know, if you just set somebody an IQ test at the age of 15 or 16, and um, that would be as, as good a method as any of it establishing you know, uh, how useful they're going to be economically. Um, the economists, when they try to calculate the economic benefits from education, they have a number of concepts. Uh, the first one of them is the private rate of return for education. And this calculates the income that people get from education um, after you allow for the direct, their direct expense in education and any income that they might have forgone while they were at college. And um, this involves thinking of, thinking of education spending as an investment and calculating what percentage return an individual gets for his or her education. Um, and then they have the private returns and then they have the social returns which looks at how much the society is spending on students and um, the benefits which then accrue to society as a whole. I mean this is more complicated and more uh, tricky to work out but they are quite happy to do that and you know, I, I find lots of the stuff here a bit tricky and spurious to be honest. But um, most economists agree that the returns from pri the private returns are very high and the social returns are even positive. The uh, Deering Committee, which I've mentioned before, into higher education, maintained that since the late 1960s, the long-run social return to higher education has run at 7 to 9 percent a year.
See, I think there's a sort of spurious um, objectivity here. Uh, you know, you can get lifetime incomes and link these to years at school. And then you can compute the cost of schooling in terms of private and public expenditures. Um, and then, you, you know, so you can even compare the returns against the returns from non-human capital. Um, but to establish the cause and effect relationship is, is, is trickier. You know, there's a cro close correlation between intelligence and the years of school. And another um, correlation between wealth of parents and length of schooling. And uh, in order to be effective, you know, you're going to have to strip out um, this sort of thing, try to calculate which uh, causes are relevant here. Uh, you know, it could well be that, uh, you know, you stay at school for longer and then you earn more. But that might be because you're obviously uh, more intelligent or more energetic or whatever. But they just assume you stay long, you stay longer at school, and therefore um, that's the that's the cause behind the higher uh, income. And a lot of the work, another another point here, a lot of the work has been done um, around about nineteen in the nineteen seventies, and in Britain at that time, you had people, you know, five to ten percent of um, Students were going to people were going to university. At the time I went to university, and um, you had a quite rigorous examination system, which took simply people to university. Now, the obvious point to make is that even if these people hadn't gone to university, wouldn't there have been more economically successful than the average Joe in the street? You know, they had they, they had the ability to go to university, pass these exams, study. Uh, uh, do work within a, within a certain time frame, as a, which is a commercial um, commercially desirable attribute, and then to extrapolate from the success of this group to assume, therefore, that you extend the education more and more, that you'll get the same results, because there's a big there's a big there's a big jump, and I'll, I'll say more about that as we. Go on. Um, there are also other problems with income calculations, which uh, Professor Wolf mentions, uh, and, and these can be misleading um, on the relationship between education and economic growth. See, an important condition for economic prosperity is obviously a legal system which enforces contracts. And uh, if you have a legal system, you've got to have lawyers. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm not fond of them particularly, I don't know many people who are, but you've got to have them. And, um, but you've got to be a bit wary about linking lawyers' salaries too closely to, uh, with economic growth. Um, you know, the number of lawyers and the salaries they get might have something to do with the volume of law and regulation in particular society. To assume that because you, lawyers are well paid, you should send even more and more people to law school to improve growth. You can get funny results from that. Obviously. I saw the, um, I watched the Max Kaiser uh, program on Russia Today now and then, it's quite amusing, and I can recommend it. And uh, he pointed out that uh, a similar sort of quirk in GDP stats, uh, that um, now in uh, the US, that um, the uh, prison system costs about 600 billion a year. It's bigger than um, Medicare or Medicaid, and becoming a huge uh, huge facet of the uh, American economy, you know. But of course, anybody can see it. And he sees, of course, that you expand it more and more and more and put everybody in prison. It's not necessarily going to be a you know, successful <laughs> procedure for growing the American economy. You know? And that's the sort of thing you get with uh, uh, these um, stats. I mean, there was um, uh, UNESCO. I had a quote of Alison Wolf, uh, Wolf a quote from UNESCO. And uh, she talks about a close relationship between educational planning, this is UNESCO in 72, and national overall plans for economic and social development. And of course, the result of um, th this sort of thinking was you've got a plethora of expensively educated uh, bureaucrats and uh, planners and low growth rates. But if you were to follow the uh, 
rate, late rate of return analysis for these people who had all been sent to university at, at great expense and then got good jobs. You know, it looks like you're doing a clever thing there. Of course, if you're a peasant farmer, the more and more uh, people, uh, bureaucrats, having to prepare for it is not a good thing. And it's not going to mean more growth. It's going to mean less growth. And uh, uh, Alison Walsh, she says at one point, um, she's discussing the benefits from expanding the number of lawyers and bureaucrats and people like that. She says, on the contrary, it's no more self-evident that since some education makes some of us rich, more would make more of us richer than it is that two aspirin good means five aspirin better. It's quite neat. Um, also, there's a lot, a, lots of things um, which the uh, human capital people and, uh, come up with, and they look at cross-country comparisons, for instance. And uh, this, again, is very inconclusive. Uh, one of the examples in Wolf's uh, book, it was uh, in 1980, Egypt was the uh, 47th poorest country in the world in terms of capital and GDP. Uh, and 15 years later, it was the 48th poorest. Though in the meantime, the educational sector had expanded considerably. Uh, South Korea, in that same period, uh, had also expanded its uh, economy somewhat and um, sent more, more and more of its uh, people to university. Um, so that, in fact, by uh, the mid 90s, it had a high proportion there. And, uh, you know, the one case where South Korea enjoyed high economic growth and increased the educational sector. And you had a place like um, Egypt, which had a poor economic growth, and also edu educated, uh, sorry, expanded the education sector somewhat. But, of course, they always use South Korea as the example uh, when they want to make the case for more spending on education. The, um, there are places like Hong Kong and Singapore, um, and, he, and I met, already mentioned Switzerland, which have a relatively small, by uh, international standards, education sector. And of course, they've done very well over the last um, 50 years in uh, economic growth. Um, and uh, my feeling is that the evidence of the different countries around the world tends to show that it's economic growth which more often than not results in education rather than education causing economic growth. And um, to put it in the economic terms, I think education is basically a, a consumption good and not a capital good as uh, the, um, the people like Becker think. There, was, uh, there are two American economists called Mark Bills and uh, Peter Klenau, and they tried to test out the, uh, the Becker idea. And, um, you know, they tested out the idea that uh, uh, education increases productivity and therefore the educators will have higher wages. And uh, it's the case that as the workers become more experienced, this is just generally, and build up skills, they'll earn more. And uh, this, is, this is called the experience premium. And um, Bills and Klenow, they pointed out that um, if the additional education has improved productivity uh, in the short term, so that the workers have less to learn when they start work, and in the long term, the workers learn faster and more effectively, then wage statistics should register this fact. We should expect this, the experience premium to decline over time. And highly educated young workers should get paid more on entry to a job than previous generations did, but accumulate less of an experience premium because they have less to learn. And moreover, those countries with the most rapidly narrowing premiums should grow the fastest as they benefit from the increasing number of well-educated young workers. Well, Bills and Klein are tried to test this, and they just didn't detect any trend at all. And um, the size of the experience premium seemed to bear little relation to the growth rates of different countries. And all they could de detect was the um, 
phenomenon of the fast-growing economy generating uh, further schooling. And I think this is, you know, I, I think that it's the education which is providing the certificates, the ranking, which is the uh, critical point, and not that you're learning particular skills, which you can then go on to use in your job. Um, one of the things that uh, Wolf does is to uh, look at this problem also from the structure, the occupational structure of the economy, rather than looking at it from the point of view of the individual worker. And, um, I mean, there's a lot of this uh, blabber which you get all the time. And uh, shots, I mean, I watched uh, Sky News um, review of the papers recently, and you had George Galloway it wasn't too bad actually, and somebody else on with them, and they, uh, he came out with this flip line, which you hear a lot, that um, the costs of education are uh, huge, but the costs of ignorance are far greater. Oh. You know, that, that sort of, so, he knows. That, 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 that's, uh, <laughs> he should do. that's a typical, that's a typical thing. <laughs> And uh, you get lots of these sort of remarks, and um, <laughs> the horse's mouth. Uh, you can, um, you know, we used to hear the talk about the knowledge economy. You know, the Western economies have moved from manufacturing goods to manufacturing ideas. That was one of the uh, uh, flip remarks that they used to make. This turgid jargon. But, um, but of course now. After the crash, that's all gone. And now they're having to decide, well, we better manufacture some goods after all, if we can find anybody to, uh, <laughs> to do it, you know. Um, uh, but the, um, what you're looking at, really, is the occupational structure of the new economies in the 21st century as, as they saw it. And, uh, of course, they're, they're right, obviously, in some sense, that the coal miners, Jobs like coal mining have all but disappeared across most of the Western world. Um, but they're quite wrong in assuming that all the new jobs are going to require high degrees of skill, which you can only learn in the university. Um, and low-skilled jobs still exist by the million. They're going to carry on existing, in my view. Uh, two of the fastest uh, growing sectors of the uh, last decade were... were um, care assistants in uh, nursing homes and hospitals and answering the phone in call centres. I mean, those are two of the big uh, expansion areas of the last um, decade. And it's obvious that as, lo as long as we live in houses and apartments and we travel to work and, and shop in supermarkets, uh, there are going to be jobs for people who, to clean offices and operate the supermarkets, uh, checkouts, stack the shelves, uh, deliver boxes, you know, and do the plumbing and sort out the uh, boiler and stuff like that. And uh, fix the car, of course. Uh, all the sort of jobs which people who go to university will come out and think, well, I, don't, I didn't go to university to do that sort of job. And believe it or not, they don't. So we're having at the moment to import them in from Poland and Eastern Europe, as everybody knows. Um, See, there are many reasons why you might benefit from becoming acquainted with the novels of the Bronte sisters or starting a course in the Italian language. Uh, but there's nothing to do with uh, education for growth. Uh, you know, the, the, these are because uh, these are things that might interest you and make, make you uh, amuse you or make you a better person or something like that. Uh, Wolf says, I find it difficult to construct a convincing argument that more degrees are needed so that people will be educated enough to stack shelves, swipe credit cards, or operate a cappuccino machine effectively. And she thinks it's over-education that's the norm in the Western world, and that people are acquiring lots of skills which they're not going to be using. Um, some economists have even pointed out that lots of jobs which are the same as they were so 30 years ago, are asking now that um, candidates should have a degree, whereas 30 years ago they would have asked that they 
uh, just had the A levels, the qualifications which uh, people got when leaving school at 18. And um, I just see that education is becoming like it's becoming a race where everybody is running longer and longer. But it's still true that um, only 10% of people can still finish in the top 10%, unfortunately. Um, she, uh, she, she goes into other things, by the way, which I just mentioned in passing in here very briefly. Uh, I mean, I think her views on the um, human capital debate are the most interesting. But she also, um, she, laments, she laments the fact that the increase in student numbers has reduced the average quality of university education and produced this famous dumbing down effect, which is uh, one of the topics of computation. But I don't see how you can not have that. You know, if you're sending more and more students <coughs> to university, um, the courses are going to have to be very palatable and passable for the majority of the students. They're not going to all go to university and fail. I mean, in any case, 20%, I gather, of uh, people who go to university drop out after the first year in any case. So if you make it harder, it's going to, it's going to be, become quite ridiculous. Um, she also uh, is sad that there's this... Um, uh, there's a financial stringency. And she was writing this book, by the way, when, just when the um, Blair government brought in the first tuition fees, which were about 3,000 a year. So we haven't actually had the full effect of um, the, uh, we don't know quite what the effect of paying out 9,000 a year or 6,000, 6, 9,000 is quite common. Um, and uh, she, you know, she laments the fact students now have to pay for all this. But again, I really have not much sympathy there. You know, the main sufferers from the expansion of education in the last 50 years are located outside, not inside the education centre. Uh, Peter Bauer said that foreign aid was the transfer of resources from the poor of the first world to the rich of the third world. Well, I think the education system is transfer of resources from the poor of the first world to the rich of the first world, on the whole. Um, That's Wolf. There are one or two other people who uh, have been critical of it. Another, another person is Ruth Lee, who's quite a decent economist. She uh, worked for the Institute of Directors, I believe. And she wrote an interesting article around about the time this book came out. And uh, she, I'll just briefly summarize it. She just looks at the point of view, not really the human capital aspect, but does it make for whatever reason, whether they're using it as a, a ranking system or um, passing on skills, does it make economic sense to uh, do a degree? And this is uh, run back 2004, when we just had the, as I said again, we just had the um, first dose of tuition fees. And, uh, she quoted the Department for Education Science saying that the uh, premium, the, the, what you gain from over a lifetime from going to university was 400,000 pounds. This is what the Department for Education Science thought. And uh, she criticizes the, um, the, their figures on the grounds that they didn't split this up into degree class or subject or and various other reasons. And she, she said there'd been a more recent um, study from Swansea University <coughs> in which uh, they thought the premium was only 150,000 that you gained over uh, a lifetime, making the allowances for the time you spent in the business. Um, over a school league with two or more areas. And uh, all, she then decided that maths and engineering and medicine, uh, according to the study, were all positive for earnings. But even at this day, 2004, arts degrees, this study decided, arts degrees for men, they tend to exclude women from, from that, because obviously a lot of women will not go into work or stay in work over a lifetime. So arts degrees for men, uh, the return was actually negative even then. Um, you know, the graduates, 
we're leaving with average debts of £20,000. So if you're going to do an arts degree just for purely economic reasons, it wouldn't make sense. Uh, and of course, if you're going to pay triple uh, what you were paying then, triple the 3000 uh, um, which, which you don't pay until you get lots of money. Inflation is very useful. Okay, we'll, we'll come, come to that sort of argument later. But they uh, they were saying that you'd lose out. Um, uh, so you know, just thinking that going to the right college and going to the um, studying the right subject uh, would be the thing to do. Um, I, I, I must just I, I'll just finish by uh, saying that. Uh, I actually came across, I used to think that it was obviously beneficial, I was a bit like Minford. And the first doubt came into me, just as a little illustration. When I, I did a degree in history, and uh, I somehow got into programming computers, which is a long story, it's not important, but that's, that's how it is. And of course, most of the uh, people in uh, computers are from a scientific background, one way or another. I did meet one programmer had done a music degree, but the vast majority were from mathematics or physics or chemistry or something like that. And I was working with a, a guy who I knew who, who I knew had done, had done a degree in mathematics. And I said to him, uh, this is a long, long time ago, I said to him, at one point, I don't know why, I said, well, at least you did a subject uh, which is relevant to your job now. And uh, he turned to me and he said, uh, oh, he said, it's not done. They're all relevant to say. I did a bit of Fortran programming when I was a mathematician, but the fact of the majority of stuff I did hadn't had the slightest relevance to my job as a programmer. And when he was saying this, I suddenly realized I said something pretty stupid. And, um, you know, it was getting pretty obvious. And it was at that point that I realized that the vast majority of degrees uh, are going to have next to no relevance to the job that people do in later life. And even the jobs which are superficially relevant, well, are relevant, like medicine or law. Um, yeah. And our teaching, of course, is an example of not being at all relevant to uh, the subject. Uh, you know, teachers are basically um, people who run daycare centers for <laughs> children <laughs> as, they get, as they grow older. And that should be obvious to you, um, as you are a teacher. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and pedophiles. <laughs> but, um, Aren't your wages? No, at that, at that point I, I, I realised this, and that, that, that even for the people who do, and, and this, you know, someone who did, obviously went and did a degree in computer science, is not doing something totally relevant to what they're doing, but most of the stuff that they're going to learn, they're going to learn on the job. Uh, and, um, anyway, let, uh, let, let's hear the, uh, Let's see the country case to this. Ah, yes. Is there anyone? John? Yeah. Yes, of course. John? Yeah. Unless I missed it in the first few minutes, Steve, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I didn't notice you making a clear distinction between training and education. And because of the current egalitarian filth, they completely muddle these two things together, they call it all education, whilst education, uh, from the root educare, means to draw out, and, you know, develop you as a person, that's what the very word means, while training is simply teaching you something useful. And if you take this distinction seriously, then we have to see that, uh, that for instance, plumbers and doctors and lawyers have merely been trained, uh, uh, which is why if you have a conversation with a lawyer, uh, you're not really talking to an educated man. He hasn't been so educated past A level. Uh, Amy, that is. <laughs> so, and uh, <laughs> once is. you uh, make this distinction clearly, and it isn't, I mean, it isn't merely the latest or snobbish, then uh, you see that. One thing is inherently financially useful, and that's training, 
And the other one is a consumer good, and that's education. Education is a consumer good, training isn't. But you must make a clear distinction between the two. My niece used to often, as one of her things, every time I went for Sunday lunch with my parents and met my niece, <coughs> one of my nieces, she would get me to explain what philosophy was to her. And uh, eventually she had to stop because uh, she was laughing so much that it was painful. Uh, she went on to do business studies. I'm sure she's very happy, but the world of the intellect is nothing to her whatsoever. Uh, so, introduce this distinction. If we were to go back, if the government were to go back to the system of polytechnics, where you're actually teaching people technical skills, it would be a bit clearer. But of course, amongst those technical skills, we also have to have the, the so-called professions, which are no more than technical skills. Uh, and, uh, well, I'll draw a line under it uh, there and leave it to you to comment. Well, I don't, you know, I think a lot of uh, courses which would go under training I've also got nothing to do with um, uh, your ability to do further jobs. I did a course once when I was um, uh, studying uh, computing. And part of it was um, business, well it was like called business studies or management or something like that. And uh, of course we've all read some sociology books and tried to plough through the space of mumbo jumbo as they come up with it. But this, the stuff in business studies was even worse. You know, it was just the most dreadful, turgid stuff, and absolutely nothing at all to do with business and how you would uh, run um, an office or a firm. You know, so, so lots of stuff which is training is not. Um, it's, it's not happening. even training. Mm -hmm. It's yes. not even training. <laughs> no uh, education. Yes. I, 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 I mean, we could just say courses which people go to at the age of 18, uh, which I often, which might be called education, or might be called training, whatever they call them, they're not much bloody use. Certification. When, the, when they want to. Go. So Certification. Oh, and just as a final point, my understanding is it's correct that educare, E D U C E R E, does mean to lead out. Mm. There's also a Latin verb, educare, E-D-U-C-A-R-E, educare, um, from which I believe our word education is derived, and that word means to nourish. So the Romans, at least for what it's worth, didn't think it was anything to do with drawing something out of people, but putting something in. But that's, that's, that's an aside. Mm. Yes, they are. Uh, I, I, I agree with uh, all what you said, and uh, I um, never went to uh, university, and my probably highest degree is a driving license. And um, but the um, but I was in, in, in business, and uh, I I run ran a company and, uh, and things like this. You learn a lot on the job, and a lot of things that you do is uh, actually managing people, dealing with people, things like this. The technical skills um, are, in most cases, except in very specialized areas, um, irrelevant to uh, you know, the, uh, the, the business. Um, what I, but then, if you look at these very technical skills that you learn either at Polytechnic or used to learn at Polytechnic or training or engineering schools, medicine and so on, are subsidies we give businesses. So in other words, if a company that recruits engineers to do something that is very specialized is recruiting them from the state system, the state system is effectively subsidized that company would have, which would have otherwise to train these people itself. So it's not a subsidy necessarily from the poor to the rich, it's a subsidy from society to big companies. Uh, well, I, 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 I
Well, okay. I mean, it's coming coming from. Uh, I think it used to be the case that it came from most people who didn't go to university, and subsidised people who did go to university. Um, you know, the firm pays, pays lots and lots of taxes itself. Um, if it didn't pay taxes to to you know to get these people, you, you would do it. You would do it. And it's, we're looking at. Uh, Trying to calculate who's gaining out of this would be a bit tricky, wouldn't it? Um, I think usually people with jobs in education. That's who's gaining. That was the yeah, yeah. people who were being subsidised. Well, even, even so, and uh, but but lo lots of co I mean, you, you gave an example of, of, of someone who was gaining a skill going into a firm. Fine, and there are you know there are obviously cases that someone who goes. One of the people who goes on to become uh, a translator say, for, for, for a book would uh, gain from studying that language at uh, university. But vast numbers of uh, students will, and I'm, I was just one of them, uh, and uh, we'll have plenty more of them here, will have gone to further education and done not, nothing at all of relevance to their um, future vocation or jobs. You learn to become a good citizen. That that is the idea. I mean, idea. behind education and so on. So um, you know, that's, I, tend, I tend to think that that's, that's yes. I tend to think that's the opposite though, of what actually happens at the university. That it plants all sorts of daft ideas in your head about um, yeah. society, and uh, you learn to become a bad citizen to some extent. And then you get you're a good citizen before you go to university. You learn silly ideas, um, and then you leave university and become a good citizen again. The components of Tottenham riots as well in education. Um, yeah, I would actually question if our education system, our university system, is at all made to really educate people to be productive. I think it is more, uh, I mean, every system, every political system has to find a, a method to deal with in intellectuals to somehow get them into the system. And since democracies cannot you know, kill them all and, and drive them out, <laughs> as, as dictatorships would do. They have developed a, a system uh, to integrate them because, I mean, the state has a lot of control over universities. And if you look, uh, a lot of people who come out of this system basically um, are later employed by the state with good salaries, but, but basically um, are not working productively in the economy, besides from a few uh, um, degrees at, at side. But I think this whole education system that we have is not really, it, it is wrong to look at it as a, as a, it, as a system to, to make people more productive. It is, a, it is a system to integrate opposition into the system. That's, that's, that's the main purpose of it. And therefore, it's, it, 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 and as, as such, it, it, it works very well, I think. I haven't really thought about that, Nico. I mean, I'm just, dealing, I'm just dealing with the question as to what they claim. You know, this is the justification, one of the major justifications behind the expansion in the ed education system, uh, uh, tertiary education system, across the Western world. Uh, and they say that it's an econ economically going to be a good thing. And that's actually what they claim. Um, uh, so I was just dealing with that. I mean, and then when you, if I were, were to put this, these arguments to uh, these people, they'll say, oh, there's some truth in that. But don't forget, you know, it's also to make you a good citizen. Mm. No. Oh, the arts. Yeah. You the know, arts. To, to study the Bronze Sisters <laughs> or the Italian Renaissance. Yeah, to study me. Or when you tell them, right, or whatever. Them, or when you tell them, Peter Bowers, that international aid is no good. Say, oh, yeah, we know it's no good, but you've got to have our arts and give it to the money anyway. Mm. That is, that's that's right. And uh, on this business about uh, universities controlling uh, to, to keep the education. I don't know about that. I mean, look, Nico, before the, I think it's just a part of the general expansion of the state. Before the First World War in the UK, uh, all the u universities were privately financed, you know, they had uh, patronage and donations, and they were, obviously, the sector was small, but not, you know, not, not, not negligible, you know. And it was expanding all through the uh, period, the late Victorian period. And uh, so, and you know, they had say, donations and um, stocks and shares and the whole, the whole business. And then they all went into the First World War. 
stock markets collapsed, the whole, the whole caboodle. And they came out of the First World War in Britain, and they were broke. And they went to the government and said, well, we're broke, we want some money from you. And that's how it started. That's how the state involvement in the tertiary sector in this country started. Well, I think it, it could be argued that it's not university education, it's not even, not even a consumption group. Time at university can be great fun. Time. That's because you're a teenager or uh, early 20s and um, drinking a lot, shagging around, meeting people, all sorts of people who are your own age, your own sort of um, bent for some of them. Uh, more so than in the, the general world, the world outside universities. So it's wonderful for those who like that kind of thing. And you have to go to the next and blah, blah, blah. Whatever. That's not much fun. It's it. But the rest of it is quite good fun. Um, so it, it's not even a consumption good, except the time you spend. But if you were to look at the time you spend, and the time you spend between being 15 and 25, is a time in which you were, I should hope, you became more, more knowledgeable, more adept at certain um, certain things. That's just part of growing up. So I would go further and say, if it were made illegal, illegal and rigorously enforced, to have no university, no higher education, you could read books, go on the internet, and there could be household groups assembling, no profits allowed, no wages being paid, to study together and argue together. How much difference would it really make? In the it was well, it had, what people knew. How much people would know and learn? Oh, uh, well, not very much, but I mean, the great thing from my point of view, uh, when I went to university, was it kept me away from the world of work. You know, <laughs> and, and the whole idea of work terrified me. And uh, that was one of the big incentives behind um, doing reasonably well at school and then going on to university. And when I came to the end of university, like a lot of students, I think, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the case of, uh, oh, now I'm really tooled up and I get a good job, you know. Was, oh my God, what am I going to do now? <laughs> John? Uh, when it comes to schooling, uh, if you want your children to be as educated as possible, then obviously you've got to go in for something like home education. But if it goes past what you're able to do, Tutors are the thing. If you want your children to really excel, uh, then you, you get some tutors. Now, tutors don't need to cost that much. It, w it won't, won't cost uh, anything like as much as it does to send uh, a child to uh, a public school. So the, the question arises, why do people send children to public schools? It isn't actually for the education at all. It's so you become part of the, the old boy network and part of the hierarchy. You meet people there, that you stay, and you that you know them, for, and uh, you've got contacts. And CV. Well, yeah. no, I think the main reason I, I, is the one I get. Oh, oh, also to kick him out of the house. Yeah, day, day, <laughs> day, you are, day <laughs> care centre. No, I've seen that. The day care centre, so that they, uh, if, they, if the parents go <laughs> go to work, yeah. then they have someone to look after the child. And the other reason, of course, even, even if they don't go to work, or one of them goes to work, she gets a bit of peace and quiet. Mm. It's certainly true to say, in the Ivy League system in America, part of, part of the payback for paying so much to get is that you know the people, you know the people, the people who are going to be part of the establishment. You know. It is handy. Oh, it's very I'm important. also referring back to your earlier point about the, the earnings of those in university. How many of those go to legal monopolies, medical monopolies, um, state employment. If you stripped out all of those, all of those wages, it's you, true. But what, you, you, what would it appear to pay? You might see the, you know, the path through the universities lead, leading to one of the privileged monopolies. <laughs> oh, I believe, I believe in America, most of the increased spending on education is actually spending on schools, sports teams, teachers' salaries, teachers' pensions. Uh, periods off sick by teachers and, and associated teaching staff. In some sense, teachers say it's ridiculous. By the way, I just forgot, I just spent, you yeah, need a minute, yeah, I'll just mention this, I forgot, I forgot to mention it actually at the end. Thank you. David sent me this. And uh, he, uh, he, he, he sent me this, it was quotes Thomas Sowell's Basic Economics. And um, I must try and get over the book. And he has a section on human capital, evidently. 
and Sol says, uh, while human capital can take many forms, there is a tendency of some to equate it with formal education. However, not only may many other valuable forms of human capital be overlooked in this way, the value of formal schooling may be exaggerated and its counterproductive consequences, in some cases, not understood. The Industrial Revolution was not created by highly educated people, but by people with practical industrial experience, and David mentioned um, uh, George Stevenson. Uh, um, he was the guy who, was it steam engine? Yeah, he got uh, the uh, steam engine, and, and evidently uh, Sowell mentions that the Wright brothers never went to college, and uh, Thomas Edison had only about three months of formal school. Yeah. I completely accept what you said about a lot of training being pretty useless and, it, and, and what some people would now call certification. In the guise of training, they, you've got to fill the course with something, so they put various things in them. They're in there for all sorts of reasons, physically correct and just to hand it out, whatever. But there is a real distinction between uh, uh, education and training, and I, I, when I, uh, I try to explain philosophy to uh, a couple of people a um, uh, year or two ago, and I just couldn't get it through to them. They just said, it's just all bullshit. I just can't understand why you think this is education. And uh, so I said, look, is it, is it, it, works like, it works like this, really. So if you want to understand the distinction, you can easily imagine a trained dog uh, who would stand on its hind legs, jump through groups of fire or whatever. So that would be uh, that would be quite remarkable and clever. So what you can't imagine is an educated dog. That would be a miracle. So that's the difference between education and training. That's a dogmatic point. I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm not ever. First of this uh, distinction that you make, yeah, I, I, it's not particularly relevant to anything I've said, but no. fine. Richard? Um, yeah, actually, um, I wasn't sure if I was going to agree to start with, but um, yeah, I don't see why uh, really the education at the university has to take three years. Uh, when I was a student, we only had to do eight hours a week of lectures and tutorials, and I, when I was there, I thought, is that it? You could do, you could do the whole, the whole thing could be done in one year, not for really. And when I did graduate, the excuse I heard more often than anything else for not giving me a job was that I was overqualified. I thought so was not being there. Oh, we have to make people who are the kind of mates there. I would rather swap the degree for my dad being chairman of the family stock program. Yeah, right. I mean, one thing I remember from university was that uh, the art subjects, in terms of um, going into college, were much easier than uh, the science subjects. I, I shared, shared a student house with uh, someone who studied in geology and some other subjects. And they had to get up every morning, go to the lab, do three hours. And in the afternoon, it was like a job, you know. And I saw this part, and I was doing history. And uh, you know, we had maybe um, half a dozen lectures in a week if they weren't cancelled because something. Like that. And um, that, so I don't know. I think they just have it as three years because some courses would take three years. Because uh, maybe like physics or, or, or chemistry, just reading the harvest, uh, which are fully, you know, and the time is fully, pretty fully utilised. So they think, oh, well, we better make the uh, arts courses three years as well, you know. <laughs> the one private university we have in this country, the University of Buckingham, of course, does do their degrees in two years. Now, if you, if that's what. If you can get it from three years down to two years with one university competing with about a hundred others, uh, you know, I think you can easily get it down to a year with a, a bit more competition introduced into the system that is scrapping the state involvement altogether. Of course, that, when it comes to the point where um, people are paying for the courses, 
uh, this time uh, differential is going to become important. So the shorter the course, the better. Um, I can't, Nico might be able to tell me, but I, li I lived in Germany for a while. I got the impression that the courses took four years there, and there were lots of uh, postgraduates, students who I knew, who'd been doing PhDs for about 10 years from now. Oh, you used to be 15, 20 years. And uh, I was amazed by this at the time. Uh, but, but there we go. No, courses, courses in Germany, the traditional German system was four to five year, year normally, but only like 10% made it in that time. So normally you would study for seven, eight years. Mm -hmm. And you have lots of students in the late 20s, early 30s, just doing, just about finishing their first degree. That's, that's how it works. I think if we had proper competition, then scrap any idea that it should take any amount of time. And they simply say, okay, yes. you can simply sit your finals now if you think you're ready for it. Good point. Now, Ruth Lawrence, when she went to university, I think at the age of 10, to do maths. She was forced to twiddle her thumbs for about three years. She then was allowed to sit her finals. She walked out after about an hour having answered all of the questions. And she got, she enough, work. She got enough marks to get the equivalent of three firsts. Basically, they wasted three years of her life by making her. Of course, all the other students hated her. But <laughs> But they hadn't been hothoused, as she had been. Well, I think she was right, too. Well, look how she so, look how she had been then. So, 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 so there would definitely be, uh, in, with competition between the system, you could go straight You could go straight for the final exam. Oh, a similar example of this was the, uh, you must have seen the film uh, Catch Me If You Can, uh, where he's a, he does a famous uh, impersonates pilots and, counterfeits money and whatever. Uh, one of the things, and this is apparently true, is, is he um, sits and passes his bar finals in, 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 in a matter of weeks, and the, the detective who eventually catches him says, I just can't understand how you sort of hack the computer to fiddle the system. He said, no, no, he said, I just read the books and sat the exams in six weeks and passed. It's, it really isn't that difficult. But, you know, I think... The reason why he's going to keep it three years is because of Bob's network. I mean, you, know, you do meet the people who you know the rest of your life. I mean, look at how many people from Warwick University around there. Yeah. But you do, it, it is a, it's now a meeting yeah. place of, of, of where you, young people are. That's you know, another problem with it. Yes. But there will be other ones. You might, when I went to university, it reminded me of Buckley, so I've been to a few years earlier. Except that he had a library on the periphery of the campus. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, I'll I, I have a little comeback about school. I didn't spend that time at time time. About half the time, I was teaching people who were interested in what I wanted to teach, what I wanted to learn. And that's why we spent our time. We got very, very enthusiastic about mathematics. That was true when I went to independence. So. Yes, I, I think that there are schools which are academically oriented. And you went to, I think you taught in a private school. And perhaps there's some state, state schools like that where there are, there is definitely some academic. But the vast majority of um, children. And this is why it's so absurd to say, say you know, Milliband's idea is in the 60% for it. They're not academic no. orientated particularly. And there's nothing against them. It's just that they're not academically orientated. So why send them on this little uh, you know, course, uh, which is not relevant to their lives? Speak up, gentlemen. And, um, but uh, yeah, yes, I, I, I agree plainly. Uh, you know, there are people who are talented, say, in mathematics. And, um, I, like Ruth Lawrence, and obviously would, would learn a lot at school, and uh, people who are good at music who, who, who would learn. But um, for the vast majority of people who are not academically oriented, I still think, and of course, no doubt they do pick up things at school, I'm not going to deny that either, that schools basically function as daycare centers. That's why, by, that's why, by the way, there was a book which came out. Um, about 1970, it was part of this counterculture movement by Ivan Illich, and um, who was a de-schooling society. De -schooling society. Yeah. He, was, he was a Catholic um, 
theologian, but he came along, and he, he went into schools, and um, he saw what, really, you can all see, that lots of what, what goes on in schools has nothing at all to do with learning. People marching around, yeah, right. going to things, kept in order, yeah. uh, and he, he then comes to the conclusion that schools are, you know, are sources of oppression, and we have to de-school society. Mm -hmm. And of course, he saw, he saw a lot of it, but I still think he's wrong because he thought that schools were for education, you see, that was his mistake. And then when he discovered that there were, he thought there was some sort of terrible thing going on. But of course they're not for education, they're daycare centres. And in Victorian time, remember in, in Britain, uh, schools were private exactly. Exactly. until about 1870. And they were growing rapidly and parents were voluntarily sending their children to schools. Uh, in Britain without the state intervening. So showing that there really was a demand for schools. But as I, as I said, for, for the main reason being uh, for daycare Well, also that the parents couldn't read and they thought my kids could read, they'd get a better job. You, know, you, you, you sometimes see these um, stories about in, in America or even in London now, I guess, where they go, uh, children are taken, goes into schools and they search for bloody knives and uh, yeah. weapons and things yeah. like that. Well, you know, people, for knives aren't bloody. Uh, Those bloody and, knives. And, uh, <laughs> people, you know, people have completely lost the, the, the point of schools there, you know, because they are daycare centres, so the parents are sending them, the children from one area, the home, mm -hmm. where their relatives are safe, well, yeah. into, so so much, into, into a daycare centre, where, where they're yeah. less safe. You know, it's missing the point because they're not being cared for. I mean, I went to a second month of school and I always used to think on the way home. It's a good job no one at home asked me where I'm going to learn today, because I'll have to say nothing. Yeah. Yeah. In second month of school, you learn nothing. And I remember a school teacher at the age of 13 giving me a lecture, saying, you lot, she was addressing the whole class. She says, you lot have got the world at your fingertips here. You can learn hell a lot of this. I was like, I hope I'll never forget this. She's a very beautiful young lady of about 23. I said, I hope I'll never forget that what she's telling me is downright bloody nonsense. There's no opportunity <laughs> here whatsoever. <laughs> I hope I'll never forget this. I hope I'm not one of the others who, you know, passing you out of it, you, 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 you say bygones are bygones and say, yes, it was, a, it was okay after all. This is not okay, and I hope I And of course, I never did forget it, and, and you know, throughout the rest of my life, I've advocated uh, for the Ivan Illich, you know, the de schooling thing, and uh, you'll be homeschooling in summer hill, and that sort of stuff. Yes, John? Yeah. This, uh, this makes me realise, actually, uh, what, insofar as I have any intellectual abilities whatsoever, uh, why I have them definitely had nothing to do with sludge mouth comprehensive where I went to. It was my father's bookshelves. On my father's bookshelves I read de-schooling society, uh, virtually everything I think ever wrote, um, you know, Alvin Toffler's future. My father used to read these books. I used to sit and watch him reading these books. Why is he reading those it's books? That reading. must be interesting, it must be important. So after he'd finished with them I'd get them and I'd read them. And I, you know, some of it would sink in, and, and that's actually what made me have some sort of an intellect. It had absolutely nothing to do with my school whatsoever. I mean, I mean, to be fair, I'll, I'll start with Jeremy a bit here. Yes, I, I think that's most children's experience, but it's possible. You must admit that it is possible that something that happens at school... You went to a girls' school? Yeah. Something that happens at school could yes. stimulate you. For instance, like one good there teacher. was one teacher yeah. Yeah. who uh, taught history, and this is why I studied the damn thing, you know, yeah. and he was actually interested in the subject. Yeah. Now, that itself is rare, that you have a teacher mm. which is interested in the subject that they teach. Yeah. They don't tell you that. Uh, <laughs> they don't tell you that on the news. Mm. But that is a rarity. Mm. And... Um, he had all sorts of ideas, many which I thought, which I suspect were, were completely wrong. For, for instance, he, he, he talked about the Great Depression, he said, uh, we had the Great Depression, but um, we had Keynes. He was a story, right? He said, he saw, well, no, he, he he sorted that out. No. <laughs> and uh, I went, oh, I said, really? But at least he'd heard of Keynes. And, <laughs> right. and, he, had and he, had also, he had another idea, which um, I, I was under the thrall of for a long time, and that was that wars never... Uh, inaugurate 
uh, changes, but merely accelerate existing changes. That's a good thesis. And, and that was interesting to me. And the guy had obviously thought, you know, now I'm not so, I think he was, like I think the First World War, in fact, he didn't argue it, dreadful changes. So I think he's wrong well, on that. Yes, he's wrong. But, but the point was, best. the guy had thought about it. So the school can produce people, but it's rare, I agree, it's rare. Right. Yeah. A lucky teacher. Because, yeah, well, um, I think it is more... It, I agree, it can happen, but more often the exact opposite happens, yes. that uh, people are actually put off of, of, of learning. Yes. I know from my experience, when I had finally some holidays from school, I could finally uh, learn stuff that I wanted to learn and, and wasn't, wasn't uh, because I had some free time and I was looked by, by other uh, pupils a little bit strange that I was reading some books that in, in, in my holidays, because this was supposed to be free time. So that schools systematically educate you that learning something is is work that that uh, is is something you have to do but it's not fun and and that that is that is kind of kind of sad because mm -hmm. then then they are not able to really learn the stuff that they actually need to learn in in their in in, the, in their lives also it, it, it educates that learning is for children and not for adults. I can remember not wanting to learn anything about mathematics because I was too old. <laughs> that was when I was about 15. <laughs> yeah. and so I, I come up with this statement that compulsory education was like an inoculation against further learning in adult life. <laughs> Work in your case, David. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. the, well, we've all heard of the labour theory of value, but now we have the expenditure theory of value. And the more that the government spends upon education, the more education there is. Is this true? Apart from the fact, no. Elaborate. Well, I would elaborate if I knew quite what the question entailed. Oh. I mean, I, I, if we're talking about what I was talking about, that we're getting more and more returns oh. in, some, in, in the sense of even capital, then I think they're now looking at these uh, figures that they're getting and they're finding that. You know, whereas somebody in 1970 who went on to university earned, you know, 400,000 pounds or more over a lifetime, that now it's getting smaller and smaller. And as I mentioned at the end of the talk, it's in some cases becoming negative. Um, but even in that case, if you have said, as you have said, that's simply because they were in the top eight, seven, ten percent. Yes. And without any university, they were in the top. Yeah, I think that's the whole point of it. And would have earned as much. And I, I, I haven't yet seen uh, any evidence that they even thought about that such an obvious point. Have you read the work of Brian Kaplan? That goes in for a lot of this. I, I haven't read Kaplan, but I, I have read a book on the whole human capital thing by uh, Blau. The smart player. And uh, it's. You know, it starts when they were discussing, discussing this question around about 1960. And there were uh, some economists who were quite critical of it. And then along comes Becker, a bit like Keynes, you know, who converts all of the economics profession to, to it. So. And I, I think, think now they're starting to question a bit more. I think Kaplan's main point is that it's all nearly signaling. In other words, it's uh, companies don't have to do the sorting out, it's going to be done, up, done for them. I mean, they can stop it. I mean, they're, they're being taxed. These people are being sorted, so they'll make use of the sorting. It's but, they, but they could have sorted themselves. They could have done it with a, a two-hour paper, yeah. as the civil yeah, service. Because, uh, as Alison Wolf said in that quotation, you could do it at the age of 15 yeah. by setting them, as they did, by setting them exams at that age, or an IQ test. Yeah. Yeah, Kaplan has been debating the whole thing this morning. Have they? Yeah. Recommend you. He doesn't even understand the economic culture. No, but he's good at other things. <laughs> yeah, I, I just think with you, I mean, my take on this is, yeah, you're right to, to uh, large extent. Um, I mean, I've always thought that a lot of it's been absolute nonsense. It's, it's pretty much the same as uh, King's argument of uh, burying money in the ground and, and uh, sending people out to find it. You know, keep them busy. They're not doing it, they're not robbing banks and they're not causing trouble. And when they find this money, they can spend it, and it's, it's going to expand the economy. Exactly the same thing. It keeps people out of trouble, they're enjoying themselves, um, you know, uh, in social groups, and it expands the economy. 
creates jobs, he puts teachers in work, he puts, puts students out of trouble and, and enjoying it. But it doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't, 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 and the whole let's go back to last weekend. And uh, we, we can go back to the. Uh, You're going back a long, 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 long time. Yeah. We can go back to the demonstration but just which we had few, recently. But, but that wasn't by the yeah. Most of them, not oh, today. Yeah. Students still full of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. But what about the Tottenham Lions? Well, that wasn't students. That wasn't students. I wasn't with any big idiot. It was anarchists, wasn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. The police. I mean, that was, I think it was really the police, they policy, didn't they? It's about killing people. Well, yeah, they, yeah, they, they killed people <laughs> and they stood by and refused to stop the riots. Yeah. But well, when you, when you, when, I mean, when you've got the person in charge yes, of the police now, proper excuse for killing you know, in, in charge of the Menenzi's killing, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's a red rag to a book. Very good, let me grab the point here. That's the first strand. There's three strands on this. I mean, the second strand is mm -hmm. this. That when you, you mention the thing about the sleep and the Industrial Revolution, how it was uh, uh, started by people who were practical, uh, who weren't very well educated, and what have you, and steam. I mean, it might have been kicked off like that. But if you take the steam, a good example of the steam engine, starting on a very practical basis by simple industrialists. But the, all the, the, the main engineering was on the, on the modern steam engine, what became the modern steam engine, was done from here at University College by Trevedic. Trevedic? He's working in Devon. Oh, here he is. Most of his work here. No, he didn't. Well, he had a big plaque in Devon. Oh, they'll claim him if they can, but, but I don't think he was. In fact, he's a very no. educated engineer. He did his work in Devon. Mathematics no. and physics and all that. So, I mean, chemistry. There was a lot of mathematics to it. And he was good at mathematics, but he didn't go to college to study mathematics. Yeah. Well, there's been a way to try to find the facts in the college too. Yeah, so, yes, yeah, but in, 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 in Devon, yeah, Cornwall. Yeah. But that, that takes us on to research and what have you. I mean, especially today with modern research with electronics and so forth. I mean, you do need, um, you do need a, a lot of investments in that to progress in industry and so forth. Let's find the top line. Let's go a bit. Then there's another, did this for years. Yeah. But then there's another strand to this. Yes. What, you, what you touched on here is about lawyers, accountants, uh, a, a lot of to do with medicine as well. This is what this is what I call the uh, the magicians, like the magician's wand, where they're not really they're, they're, what they're doing is uh, selecting people to teach them how how to. Uh, conjecture this and conjecture that so that other people can't see them to, to do tricks but that's an important thing I mean effectively not pretty much like a magician I mean sim just to give you a simple example um, if you if you've got shares with or, or, or pension uh, with, with, with a company then you you might find the bump coming through your letterbox is about you know an inch thick uh, with all the statements and the, the financial forecasts and every other Thing that's involved in them. One thing, you, and you find the profiles of the chairman, of the company secretaries, of the board, and what have you. What you won't find in there, no matter how thick it is, and I've had some quite thick, six inches thick in some cases, A4, you won't find a single sentence telling you how much you are paying for all the people with their profiles in there. Not a single statement, believe me. Now, when you, when you paid into that, they wanted to know how much you were earning, how much tax you were paying, your health, uh, what your liability was, and they all direct every, every little ins and outs about you. Uh, but on the other hand, they don't give you any information whatsoever about themselves, what they're taking out of your fund and paying themselves with. You'll never find that anywhere, and it'd be virtually impossible to get hold of that. That's because they're the magicians who've been told how to weave their way out to pension your money on. And that's a, a, like, associate, a Chartered Institute of Management Accountants, uh, ACCA, Association of Chartered Certified Accountants, 
Um, I mean, there's, there's tins and tins of them, and, and they just sell, it's a, these 14, 14 exams you take to, be, to, to get ACCA qualified, and each one of them is, tells you, you know, how to, how to trick your way into stealing other people's money. But uh, the, the, then the, once you get that, then that's excluded other people from joining that club. It's a very exclusive club as well. Only about 100, 140, between 140 and 160,000 people in the UK. Not, not very many. All right. Uh, so you finish. What do you think? Let's take these. That's the magician. That's the magician bit. You know, I'm just saying there are three strands to this. Well, let's take the point. Three strands. There are two strands. One by one. Well, first the of all, the should bit, the research bit. It was only a third way for the first round. The first one was the the need to put these bottles in the ground and say, you know, oh. millions of people are to find them. I mean, that's what... So don't forget, incidentally, these people are not going to pay their money back. They have to earn, every single one of them, over £40,000 when the, the average... I believe the average salary now is twenty-five. They have to earn over forty thousand pound in their lifetime oh, to pay that money back. They'll do that. So they all go. They aren't going to pay it back. And by, by the way, after thirty years, it cuts out anyway. So they're going to wait for thirty years, and they aren't going to. Only going to wait for you to take your final exam. But so what's the? Uh... <laughs> anyway, it looks like it's free money from the. Well, let's just look at this one. One was it's free money from the tax. One was the uh, point about the engineer who did some design. Um, well, Trevenic, yeah. Well, you know, you have to be a bit careful here to establish that, um, you know, the stuff that was valuable he learned at university and didn't learn somewhere else or at a firm. I mean, the point is that anybody who's reason the vast majority of people who are reasonably bright these days will go to university, you know, inevitably, just as they go to school. But you don't say because he went to such and such a school. Um, Therefore, we have the school to thank that he designed such and such a bloody uh, computer program or whatever. On the research, well, obviously, uh, lots of companies do research. And uh, a company like Glaxo will uh, do research and employ people to research. I mean, it's uh, crucial that they come up with new drugs. And what's more, the research they do will be much more commercially orientated than the research done by universities. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that universities should do commercially orientated research. Um, I'm just saying that, um, you know, there's, pl there's plenty of good reasons for companies to research. Um, and the final point was the, um, uh, the, the... The magician bit, what I call the conjecture. Lawyers, accountants, a lot of people... A lot of uh, hocus-pocus goes into business. Yeah, I agree with that. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to dispute that, but I don't see that that's a criticism of anything I said, is it? I did have the point that he made at the beginning of his contribution, where he said that, uh, you know, in, in answer to Sowell, he said that, that was all very well at the beginning, but later on, this is often a point made, now advanced science and advanced education is needed. Yes. You know, uh, the, the, you know, that's a very common point that's made. Do you want to address that? Story? Well, I addressed it to some extent when I talked about the ma mathematician that um, I got to know who became a programmer, and he you know, he did a degree in mathematics and he pointed out that it wasn't relevant. And that much of the technical stuff which people do in engineering or programming or the more technical subjects will not be learned at university. Um, and it's certainly not essential that they go to university to learn this stuff. It's, uh, it's like that. And if, if, if there were some technical stuff really essential, then you'd get sent on a course. You know, I was sent on computer programming courses by an employer. I, th I think you know what you said about bringing back the polytechnics and, and you know, the definition of university. Is it, is it one truth? Do you mean one university truth? That there's only one truth? And, and that would be, would be at all with the whole philosophy of university anyway. Because the polytechnics used to just teach the Brontes and so on. This. Exactly the sort of stuff and philosophy and stuff. And very, very little, although they were named polytechnics, there was very little technical things. But when I got this insight that me and Steve share was when I went as an apprentice in 1963. And I started thinking myself, four, four days a week, I was thinking, 
what on earth has it got to do on Fridays, which was the fifth day of the week that I went to college? What has what I got to do on Fridays got to do with this here? <laughs> the, the job I'm learning. That was a bit to civilise you, that was the theory. Well, perhaps he tried to see the symbols. Yes, but he had nothing. What I was learning, manifestly fine. What I was learning on the day with this had absolutely nothing to do with the other four days in work. And that's how I got Stephen's insights. There's also the idea that at the end of it, you owe the state something. That whole idea as well, where you actually owe them something. Well, I don't think we can entirely leave out intellectual or human capital. However, sometimes, such as in the uh, late 18th century, we have very primitive steam engines. But they're a lot better than donkeys and horses and wind power. So we have coal used to fuel boilers, which propel beam engines, which drain the mines, which gets you more coal. Now, this worked very well, because the coal could then do, with, with other engines, a lot of work that men would have to do, donkeys, horses, and women. And for many years, these very inefficient engines, and of course, they're not getting any more coal out of the ground, they're making more engines because the price of iron is falling, transportation is taking place. Um, so we mustn't neglect simple things that aren't really much of an intellectual advance at all, but simply, um, Capital ploughed back to being more capital, yeah. not necessarily intellectual capital. You mustn't forget that there is non human capital, which is of no little importance in itself. Oh, well, well, well the, uh, I mean, I think it, well, the, Alan Smith's great insight, and he was an insight later on, and Gary Beckett's insight, is that human capital is just as good as this other capital, which they thought was obviously good. But not better, necessarily. Uh, oh, no, they didn't think it was better. So uh, it's just called capital. No, but Be Becker has never had the idea that human capital is better than ordinary capital. On the country, so you know, he has the idea that it's obvious that capital is valuable, and the human capital you're likely to overlook. See, that's what because Adam Smith's idea was, and of course it, it does exist. You know, there is human capital. Uh, you know, uh, the fact that we can speak English uh, is in fact uh, human capital. Whatever and the, you know, the fact that Chinese can speak Chinese, that's human capital. And then you've got the native Chinese English from an economic point of view, big land, and then you've got. Uh, you uh, labour, which of course is obvious, more obvious. You know. So there's land capital and labour in each human. And this is one of the reasons why Malthus is wrong, because Malthus wants to hold, uh, you know, he, he wants to add labour, and he wants to hold capital and land constant. But you can't do that because when you're adding labour, you're adding capital and uh, land. So Malthus doesn't work. Whichever way you, you cannot possibly get a situation where you hold uh, what Malthus wants to do. Uh, land and uh, capital's constant while you just add labour. There's too much human capital and too much land in the workers. So any, anyone else want to? We've been delighted enough. Well, thank you very much indeed, Stephen. It's been a marvellous talk. It's delighted to be right. Check out. We're a very bright man. We're a very loud. Well, he's a bright man as well. Uh, he's wrong, and you're right, in my opinion. My pleasure. Uh,